Hello and welcome to the channel. I'm back in beautiful Normandy to walk the ground with you. And I wish we were all here together to share a war story over a beer or two, but perhaps that's for another time. In this video, we explore one of the most maligned allied battles of World War II, but perhaps one of the most misunderstood and one in which we learnt the most, Operation Goodwood. Goodwood was a plan which saw an armoured battering ram on the open terrain east of Khan to draw the German armoured formations to the east, setting the conditions for a US breakout in the west. Here we have Khan. We haven't quite secured the east of the River Orne yet, and here we have St. Lo. By this stage, the Allies have secured most of the Cosentin Peninsula. The British and the Canadians are poised north of Khan. The Americans are moving south towards St. Lo. Operation Goodwood is launched to the east of Khan with the aim of fixing those German armoured formations. enabling the Americans to launch Operation Cobra to break out of Normandy. Now what I think of this plan is pretty much irrelevant, but to my mind, armour is designed to exploit an opportunity rather than to create one. However, we should consider this plan in the context in which it was forged, a severe shortage of manpower, a superiority in equipment, and this concept of steel, not flesh. Therefore, we see reliance in technology rather than infantry. Ground. Let's zoom into this area around Khan for an orientation. To the north of Khan, we have the D-Day landing beaches. In this case, we have Saw Beach. As we move south, we come inland and we have the Hillman Fortress, which I've covered in another video. South of that is the city of Khan. I'm sure you'll all be familiar with the crossings at Benneville. This crossing site is now called Pegasus Bridge, but there were other crossing locations here too, namely London Bridge, London Bridges 1 and 2, which were of a Bailey pontoon type construction. More on that to follow. Across the river we have Ranville, site of the glider landings and it was to become the assembly area for Operation Goodwood. As we head south, we see open countryside where we will travel all the way down to Cargny and the Borgabus Ridge, this high feature. Back to the crossing site. I want to show you this viewpoint overlooking the assembly area. This high terrain offers perfect observation onto the start line of Goodwood. You can see just how flat and how open the terrain is. Preliminary moves. The bulk of the armour is currently on the wrong side of the river and so we need to cross. Left is south towards Khan and right is north towards the beaches. Here you can see Euston 1. This is now Pegasus Bridge. We also have Euston 2. You might better know these bridges as Ham and Jam. Then we have London 1. Now this is the Bailey Pontoon Bridge with an MLC 30, with London 2 just below that. Euston 1 and Euston 2 are still in existence today, but I've added the approximate locations of London 1 and London 2. Although London 1 is probably more likely to be here. Friendly forces. Canadian 2nd Corps are north of Khan, the River Orne providing the boundary to the west. The high ground to the east provides the other boundary. 6th Airborne Division have secured the rear and our flank. Obstacles. There's an existing minefield here. Lanes have been cleared through it, but not enough. There are two train tracks marked here. And here. The urban areas of Khan are marked in grey. The Allies had to cross the river to get to the assembly area, and this would take up to four hours. Many of the vehicles had still not made it over by H hour. On H hour, 11th Armoured Division would advance south. They would screen Kanye and seize Bra, 
Herbert Folly and Virier on the Bergamos Ridge. The Guard's armoured division would advance behind them. They would clear Cagny before heading east towards Vimont. The 7th Armoured Division would then advance south to secure the Bergerbos Ridge. If the Germans were to collapse, then a deeper advance could be exploited. The key here is that these activities happen in isolation along a narrow frontage, some two kilometres wide in parts. Therefore, the superior numbers cannot be brought to bear. Enemy forces. The same obstacles exist, so it's worth highlighting them here. They have a deep four-phase defense. First phase, 16th Luftwaffe Field Division are acting as the screen. Second, they have mutually supporting fortress hamlets and villages. These are occupied by anti-tank guns and infantry. Third is a screen of self-propelled artillery and direct fire weapon systems occupying the high ground of the ridge. Finally, 4th is a mobile reserve made up of elements from the 1st and the 21st SS Panzer Division and elements of the 12th SS Panzer Division. This armour could be projected forward for counterattacks if the offensive faltered or indeed if the offensive culminated. The mobile reserve could also enable a break clean if the Allies' advance proved successful. The key to this defence is its depth, some 10 miles compared to the anticipated 4 miles deep. The mutually supporting villages with interlocking arcs of anti-tank fire were key, as well as the potent mobile reserve. Combining the existing obstacles into the defensive plan was also a masterstroke. Bombardment The bombardment was at that time the largest concentration of Allied air power in support of a ground offensive, some 2,000 aircraft in total. The bombing would augment preparatory fires by the Allied artillery, so let's look at the bombing. H hour was set for 0800. The first wave would take place at 0545, where 1,100 RAF heavy bombers would neutralize likely enemy strongpoints on the flanks. At 0700 hours, the second wave consisting of 480 US bombers would drop fragmentation bombs on the axis of advance so as not to create craters. Then from H hour to H plus 30, 540 bombers would strike the depth positions on the ridgeline and the eastern flank. These pictures of Goodwood show the impact of those waves, including a bomber in the top right-hand corner. However, there was no precision and many of the bombs would land in empty fields. For example, Kanye was bombed so heavily, but the tree lines north of here which would hide many of the anti-tank guns and the batteries, were left largely untouched. It is from these positions that the 2nd Firth and Fofar Yeomanry would suffer so badly. I'm not going to cover the artillery barrage at Goodwood in any detail. This is for another video. What I will say is that a World War I style creeping barrage was used ahead of the 11th Armour Division. This is great for battlefield inoculation, but I'm sure most people would prefer to have the rounds landing in and around the enemy target and not in open fields. The creeping barrage has no suppressive effect until the rounds are within about 250 meters. This is the lethal splinter distance. The Allies also left the artillery at the rear, meaning there was no offensive support at Cagny and beyond. H hour. As planned, at H hour, the 11th Armored Division crossed the start line. The 16th Luftwaffe Field Division had largely capitulated under the heavy bombing and shelling. They offered little resistance. However, the gun positions quickly got into action and they began to identify Allied armor heading south across the open terrain. They began to pick off their targets, often in enfilading fire into the flanks of the Allies. The Allies had a severe lack of infantry relying largely on the armor, and as a result, the Allies could not clear these wood lines effectively or the strong points in the villages. The artillery was also struggling to get into range as it was not prioritized to cross the river.
Guns of Kanye. On to Kanye, and we look at viewpoint two. This was the location of an anti-tank gun position which has now been cleared and is part of a field. But just look at this field of view. The Allies crossed this field from right to left, unaware of the enemy guns until it was too late. This would present a target-rich environment for these enemy gunners, almost unimpeded. And when you consider the high crops, corn of the season, it would offer excellent cover and concealment for your pack howitzer or your 88mm gun. Now back to this map of Kanye, and you can see where the gun positions were in this tree line and how they are left largely untouched by the bombing. In this tree line was a mixture of Major Walter Becker's self-propelled guns, as well as Pack 80 guns. There is an infamous story here concerning Major Hans von Luck. I won't go into too much detail here, other than to say he organised the defence from this position. Major Luck is a very competent and engaging commander, and there is a controversial story associated with him, but I'll leave that for another video I have planned. And this is that same tree line with excellent views of the Allies' advance, which was from right to left. The Firth and Fofo Yeomanry were advancing right here on that morning when their sea squadron was virtually wiped out by anti-tank guns from this wood line and from the villages here. This excellent picture shows the number of knocked out Allied tanks in that very field we looked at before. This is essentially viewpoint two. Sea squadron commander Major Chris Nichols of the Firth and Fofo Yeomanry was one of the first to be hit. Second Lieutenant Charlie Workman of one troop C squadron saw his commander try to climb out of his turret before falling back in. He gives us an account of what happened. As we started to get towards the second railway line, I saw tanks in front of me start to brew up. Everyone was on the regimental wireless, shouting, we've been hit. There were men running back towards us who had just escaped from their burning tanks. It was an awful scene. People were staggering past covered in blood and burns. Trooper John Fort of four troop C squadron recalls, all the tanks in front of us were burning. About 20 yards in front of me, I saw a tank boy climbing out of a turret, which was spurting flames, but he did not make it. He got one foot out of the turret and fell back inside. Explosions of burning ammunition could be seen from inside the burning tank. Huge smoke rings would leave the turrets rising high into the windless sky. Sensing the Allies' culmination at Borgibus, the Germans launched localized counterattacks to exploit their success. Not a defensive move, but a full armoured charge, as General Eberbach put it. The 1st SS Panzer Division was to attack across the ridge, while the 21st Panzer Division was to attack around the Kanye area. Trooper Terry Boyne of 4 Troops says, Panthers were reported here, there and everywhere on the wireless. You had to be within 600 metres to do any damage. Anything more in the AP shell would just skip off. There's nothing worse than watching an accurate shot bounce off a target. Trooper James Donovan of B Squadron says, Looking through my periscope, I could see the top of two tanks over a hedge in front of us. One of the tank commanders was combing his hair. He looked so unconcerned that he hadn't seen us. I can picture him now, he had bright blonde hair. I realised they were German tanks and we quickly reversed. One of the tanks came crashing through the hedge to come after us, and then, woof, a round had gone straight through the front. The next thing I heard was a shout over the net, Bail out! Trooper Donovan managed to escape his burning tank. On to viewpoint number three. Now this is of the Borgibus Ridge where the tanks and the anti-tank guns were sighted. And what a commanding view of the approach routes of the Allies. Aftermath. So you can see the journey we've taken from Ranville to Cagny and the Borgibus Ridge beyond. Often described as a British disaster, the Allies lost 126 of the 244 tanks that crossed the start line. The armoured division suffered some 521 casualties during their advance on day one. The lack of combined arms integration, specifically a lack of infantry, proved critical, as well as the artillery being out of range so early on. Bombing large swathes of land rather than targeting likely defensive locations was an error. Many of the field guns were left untouched by the bombardment, although this bombing did virtually destroy the 16th Luftwaffe field division. Dictated by the terrain, the axis of advance was restricted 
by a narrow frontage, some two kilometers in places. This meant the attack would have to be sequential rather than simultaneous, negating the advantage of the superior numbers. Now, Operation Goodwood did set the conditions for Cobra, the US offensive. By the end of July, six and a half panzer divisions were in the east and faced off against the British and the Canadians, while only a half of a panzer division was against the US troops at St. Lowe. A debate still rages about Monty's intentions for Operation Goodwood. So what do you think? Was it a success or was it a failure? Or is it more nuanced than that? Leave me a comment and we can have a chat about it. I genuinely read every single comment. Learning. Well, an Army Staff Ride basically is, um, is a training venue, it's a professional development venue for, uh, for military and civilian personnel within the Army to be able to go out to a particular battlefield or a battlefield site and be able to see the site for themselves directly, essentially face to face. The reason this action is so popular with British officers of the Cold War era is because it was exactly how NATO wanted to fight and defend against their new foe, the Soviet Union. NATO faced off against the might of the Red Army and its massed tanks battalions. These scenes of massed armour advancing across open terrain are what we expected to see in Europe again, and we trained relentlessly to defend in depth before going on to a counter-offensive. All of these things happened at Goodwood. So what lessons do you think we adopted from the Germans? Well guys, if you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button, subscribe to the channel and leave me a comment. I've only just started and I've got so much more work to do, so please join me on this journey. Until next time.